chapter eleven of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eleven the home port the darkness of the night slowly lifted revealing only a gray leaden sky there was no dawn such as had gladdened their hearts the morning before no fresh awakening of the day instead the coldness and gloom of the night seemed but to creep a little farther away leaving its shadow over the world a drizzling rain began to fall and the wanderers on the beach were destined to a new draught of misery only agatha watched however james gave no sign of caring or even of knowing whether the sun shone or hid its face he had slept fitfully since their hour of wakefulness together in the night and several times he had shown signs of extreme restlessness at these periods he would talk incoherently agatha being able to catch only a word now and then once he endeavored to get up bent apparently upon performing some fancy duty far away agatha soothed him talked to him as a mother talks to a sick child cajoled and commanded him and though he was restless and voluble yet he obeyed her readily enough as the rain began to descend agatha bethought herself earnestly as to what could be done she first persuaded james to drink a little more of the milk and afterward took what was left herself less than half a cupful then she set the bucket out to catch the rain she felt keenly the need of food and water and now that there was no one to heed her movements she found it difficult to keep up the show of courage she still trusted in hand but even at best he might yet be several hours in returning and cold and hunger can reduce even the stoutest heart if hand did not return but there was no answer to that if she believed he would come the soft rain cast a pall over the ocean so that only a small patch of sea was visible and it flattened the waves until the blue flashing white-capped sea of yesterday was now a smooth gray surface touched here and there by a bit of frothy scum agatha looked out through the deep curtain of mist remembering the night the jeanne d'arc and her recent peril most vividly of all she heard in her memory a voice shouting keep up i'm coming i'm coming ah what a welcome coming that had been was he to die now here on her hands after the worst of their struggle was over she turned quickly back to james vowing in her heart it should not be she would save him if it lay in human power to save her hardest task was to move their camp up into the edge of the brushwood where they might have the shelter of the trees there was a place near the handle of the sickle where the rock wall partly disappeared and the undergrowth from the cliff reached almost to the beach it was from here that hand had begun his ascent and here agatha chose a place under a clump of bayberry where she could make another bed for james the ground there was still comparatively dry she coaxed james to his feet and helped him with some difficulty up to the more sheltered spot he was stronger physically now in his delirium than he had been during his period of sanity in the night she made him sit down while she ran back to gather an armful of the fir boughs to spread out for his bed but she had scarcely started back for the old camp before james got to his feet and staggered after her she met him just as she was returning and had to drop her load take her patient by the arm and guide him back to the new shelter he went peacefully enough but leaned on her more and more heavily until at last his knees weakened under him and he fell agatha's heart smote her they were near the bayberry bush though entirely out from its protection as the drizzling rain settled down thicker and thicker about them agatha tried again slowly she coaxed james to his knees and slowly she helped him creep as she had crept toward him in the night along between the stones and up into the sheltered corner under the bayberry it was only a little better than the open and it had taken such prodigies of strength to get there 
agatha made a pillow for james's head and sat by him looking earnestly at his flushed face and from her heart she sighed ah dear man it was too hard it was too hard it was a long and weary wait for help though help of a most efficient kind was on the way agatha had been looking and listening toward the upper wood where her hand had disappeared she had even called from time to time on the chance that she could help to guide the assisting party back to the cove at last as she listened for a reply to her call she heard another sound that set her wondering it was the pit pit peter peter of a motor-boat she looked out over the small expanse of ocean that was visible to her but could see nothing nevertheless the boat was approaching as its puffing proclaimed it grew more and more distinct and presently a strong voice shouted ahoy are you there three times the shout came agatha made a trumpet of her hands and answered with a call on two notes clear and strong all right came back and then call again we can't find you and so she called again and again though there were tears in her eyes and a lump in her throat for very relief and joy when her eyes cleared she saw the boat and watched while it anchored well off the rocks then two men put ashore in a rowboat and where are our patients came a deep steady voice from the rocks this way sir i think mademoiselle has moved the camp up under the trees was the reply unmistakably the voice of mr hunt and there they found agatha kneeling by james and trying to coax him to his feet quick quick they have come you will be cared for now you will be well again she was saying she saw hunt approach and heard him say this way doctor there the gentleman is up here under the trees and then for the first time in all the long ordeal agatha's nerves broke and her throat filled with sobs as the ex-chauffeur came near she reached a hand up to him while with the other she covered her weeping eyes in shame oh i'm so glad you've come i'm so glad you've come she tried to say but it was only a whisper through her sobs i'm sorry i was gone so long said hand touching her timidly on the shoulder tell the doctor to take care of him she begged in the faintest of voices and then she crept away thinking to hide her nerves until she should come to herself again but hand followed her to the niche in the rocks where she fled covered her with something big and warm and before she knew it he had made her drink a cup that was comforting and good then he gave her food and little bits from a basket and sweet water out of a bottle agatha's soul revived within her and her heart became brave again though she still felt as if she could never move from her hard damp resting-place among the rocks you stay there please mademoiselle adjured mr hand when we get the boat ready i'll come for you then standing by her in his submissive way he added a thought of his own it's very hard mademoiselle to see you cry i'm not crying shrieked agatha though her voice was muffled in her arms very well mademoiselle acquiesced the polite hand and departed two men could not have been found who were better fitted for managing a relief expedition than hand and dr thayer agatha found herself after an unknown period of time sitting safe under the canvas awning of the launch protected by a generous cloak comforted with food and stimulant and relieved of the pressing anxiety that had filled the last hours in the cove she had in the end been quite unable to help but the immediate need for her help was past dr thayer coming with his satchel of medicines had at first given his whole attention to james examining him quickly and skilfully as he lay where agatha had left him later he came to agatha with a few questions which she answered clearly but james left alone immediately showed such a tendency to wander around following the hallucinations of his brain that the doctor decided that he must have a sedative before he could be taken away the needle that friend of man in pain was brought into use 
and presently they were able to leave the cove dr thayer and mr hunt carried james to the rowboat and the engineer who had stayed in the launch helped them lift him into the larger boat no more walking at present for this man said the doctor they were puffing briskly over the water with a tiny rowboat from the jeanne d'arc and the boat belonging to the launch cutting a long broken furrow behind them mr hunt was minding the engine while the engineer and owner of the launch little simon so called probably because he was big stood forward handling the wheel jim was lying on some blankets and oilskins on the floor of the boat the doctor sitting beside him on a cracker box agatha feeling useless and powerless to help sat on the narrow uncomfortable seat at the side watching the movements of the doctor she was unable to tell whether doubt or hope prevailed in his rugged countenance at last she ventured her question but before replying dr thayer looked up at her keenly as if to judge how much of the truth she would be able to bear the hemorrhage was caused by the strain he said at last slowly it is bad enough with this fever if his constitution is sound he may pull through not very encouraging but agatha extracted the best from it oh i'm so thankful she exclaimed dr thayer looked at her a deep interest showing in his grim old face while she looked at james he studied her as if some unusual characteristic claimed his attention but he made no comment dr thayer was short in stature massively built with the head and trunk of some ancient vulcan his heavy large features had a rugged nobility like that of the mountains his face was smooth-shaven ruddy brown and deeply marked with lines of care but most salient of all his features was the massively moulded chin and jaw his lips too were thick and full without giving the least impression of grossness and when he was thinking he had a habit of thrusting his under jaw slightly forward which made him look much fiercer than he ever felt thin white hair covered his temples and grew in a straggling fringe around the back of his head upon which he wore a broad-brimmed soft black hat dr thayer would have been noticeable a man of distinction anywhere and yet here he was with his worn satchel and his old-fashioned clothes travelling year after year over the countryside to the relief of farmers and fishermen he knew his science too it never occurred to him to doubt whether his sphere was large enough for him i haven't found out yet where we are or to what place we are going will you tell me sir asked agatha you came ashore near ram's head one of the worst reefs on the coast of maine and we're heading now for charlesport that's over yonder beyond that next point dr thayer answered after a moment he added i know nothing about your misfortunes but i assume that you capsized in some pesky boat or other when you get good and ready you can tell me all about it in the meantime what is your name young woman the doctor turned his searching blue eyes toward agatha again a courteous but eager inquiry underneath his brusque manner it is a strange story dr thayer said agatha somewhat reluctantly but some time you shall hear it i must tell it to somebody for i need help my name is agatha redmond and i am from new york and this gentleman is james hamilton of lynn so he told me he risked his life to save mine after we had abandoned the ship i don't doubt it said dr thayer gruffly some blind dash into the future is the privilege of youth that's why it's all recklessness and foolishness agatha looked at him keenly struck by some subtle irony in his voice i think it is what you yourself would have done sir she said the doctor thrust out his chin in his disconcerting way and gave not the least smile but his small blue eyes twinkled my business is to see just where i'm going and to know exactly what i'm doing was the dry answer he turned a watchful look toward james lying still there between them then he knelt down putting an ear over the patient's heart all right he assured her as he came up but we never know how those organs are going to act 
satisfying himself further in regard to james he waited some time before he addressed agatha again then he said very deliberately the ocean is a savage enemy my brother hercules used to quote that old greek philosopher who said praise the sea but keep on land and sometimes i think he was right agatha's tired mind had been trying to form some plan for their future movements she was uneasily aware that she would soon have to decide to do something and of course she ought to get back to new york as soon as possible but she could not leave james hambleton her friend and rescuer nor did she wish to she was pondering the question as the doctor spoke then suddenly at his words a curtain of memory snapped up my brother hercules and charlesport she leaned forward looking earnestly into the doctor's face oh tell me she cried impulsively is it possible that you knew hercules thayer that he was your brother and are we in the neighborhood of ilion yes 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 assented the doctor nodding to each of her questions in turn and i thought it was you agatha shaw's girl from the first but you should have come down by land he dictated grimly oh i didn't intend to come down at all cried agatha either by land or water at least not yet dr thayer's jaw shot out and his eyes shone but not with humour this time he looked distinctly irritated but my dear miss agatha redmond where did you intend to go agatha couldn't by any force of will keep her voice from stammering as she answered i wasn't going anywhere i was kidnapped dr thayer looked sternly at her then reached toward his medicine chest my dear young woman why is it that when a person is particularly out of temper he is constrained to say my dear so and so my dear young woman said dr thayer that's all right but you must take a few drops of this solution and let me feel your pulse indeed doctor it is all so just as i say interrupted agatha i'm not feverish or out of my head not the least bit i can't tell you the whole story now i'm too tired yes that's so my dear child said the doctor but in such an evident tone of yielding to a delirious person that he nearly threw her into a fever with anger but on the whole agatha was too tired to mind he took her hand felt of her pulse and slowly shook his head but what he had to say if he had anything was necessarily postponed the launch was putting into the harbor of charlesport even on the dull day of their arrival charlesport was a pleasant-looking place stretching up a steep hill beyond the ribbon of street that bordered its harbor fish-houses and small docks stood out here and there and one larger dock marked the farthest point of land a great derrick stood by one wharf with piles of granite block nearby little simon was calling directions back to hand at the engine as they chucked past fishing smacks and mooring poles past lobster pot boys and a little bug lighthouse threading their way into the harbor and up to the dock agatha appealed to the doctor with great earnestness surely dr thayer it is a providence that we came in just here where people will know me and will help me i need shelter for a little while and care for my sick friend here where can we go dr thayer cast a judicial eye over the landscape while he held his hat up into the breeze it's going to clear it'll be a fine afternoon said he then deliberately why don't you go up to the old red house sally kingsbury's there keeping it just as she did when hercules was alive waiting for you or the lawyer or somebody to turn her out i guess and it's only five miles by the good road you couldn't go to any of these sailor shacks down here and the big summer hotel over yonder isn't any place for a sick man let alone a lady without her trunk agatha looked in amazement at the doctor go to the old red house to stay why not if you're agatha redmond it's yours isn't it and i guess nobody's going to dispute your being agatha shaw's daughter looking as you do 
the house is big enough for all creation and besides they've been on pins and needles waiting for you to come or write or do something the doctor gave a grim chuckle hercules surprised them all some by his will but they'll all be glad to see you i guess unless it is sister susan she was always pretty hard on hercules and she didn't approve of the will thought the house ought to go to the foundling asylum agatha looked as if she saw the gates of eden open to her but could i really go there would it be all right i've not even seen the lawyer there was no need of answers to her questions she knew already that the old red house would receive her would be a refuge for herself and for james who needed a refuge so sorely the doctor was already making his plans i'll drive this man here indicating james and he'll need some one to nurse him for a while too you can go up in one of simon nash's wagons and i'll get a nurse up there as soon as i can the launch had tied up to the larger dock and hand and little simon had been waiting some minutes while agatha and the doctor conferred together now as agatha hesitated the business-like hand was at her elbow i can help you mademoiselle if you will let me i have had some experience with sick men agatha looked at him with grateful eyes only half realizing what it was he was offering the doctor did not wait but immediately took the arrangement for granted he began giving orders in the tone of a man who knows just what he wants done and knows also that he will be obeyed you stay here mr hand and help with this gentleman and little simon here you go up to your father's livery stable and harness up quick as you can then drive up to my place and get the boy to bring my buggy down here with the white horse quick you understand tell them the doctor's waiting agatha sat in the launch while the doctor's orders were carried out little simon was off getting the vehicles dr thayer had run up the dock to the village street on some errand saying he would be back by the time the carriages were there and hand was walking up and down the dock keeping a watchful eye on the launch james was lying in the sheltered corner of the boat ominously quiet his eyes were closed and his face had grown ghastly in his illness tears came to agatha's eyes as she looked at him seeing how much worse his condition was than when he had talked with her almost happily in the night she herself felt miserably tired and ill and as she waited she had the sensation one sometimes has in waiting for a train that the waiting would go on for ever would never end the weather changed as the doctor had prophesied and the rain ceased fresh gusts of wind from the sea blew clouds of fog and mist inland while the surface of the water turned from gray to green from green to blue the wind blowing against the receding tide tossed the foam back toward the land in fantastic plumes agatha looking out over the sea which now began to sparkle in the light longed in her heart to take the return of the sunshine as an omen of good it warmed and cheered her body and soul as her eyes turned from the sea to the village tossed up beyond its highest tides she searched though in vain for some spot which she could identify with the memories of her childhood she must have seen charlesport in some one of her numerous visits to ilion as a child but though she recalled vividly many of her early experiences they were in no way suggestive of this tiny antiquarian village or of the rocky hillside stretching off toward the horizon a narrow road wound athwart the hill leading into the country beyond it was steep and rugged and finally it curved over the distant fields but the old red house was the talisman that brought back to her mind the familiar picture she wondered if it lay over the hill beyond that rugged road she closed her eyes and saw the green fields the mighty balm of gilead tree the lilac bushes and the dull red walls of the house standing back from the village street not far from the white steepled church she could see it all plainly the thought came to her suddenly that it was home it was the first realization she had of old hercules thayer's kindness it was home for her who had else been homeless she hugged the thought in thankfulness 
now miss agatha redmond if you will come the eternity had ended and time with its swift procession of hours and days had begun again End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 12. Seeing the Rainbow A few days on a yacht, with a calm sea and sun-cool weather, may be something like a century of bliss for a pair of lovers, if they happen to have taken the lucky hour. The conventions of yacht life allow a companionship from dawn till dark, if they choose to have it there is a limited amount of outside distraction if the girl be an outdoor lass she looks all the sweeter for the wind rumpling her hair and on shipboard if anywhere mental resourcefulness and good temper achieve their full reward aleck had been more crafty than he knew when he carried melanie and madame reynier off on the seagull almost at the last moment mr chamberlain had joined them aleck's liking for the man and his instinct of hospitality overcoming his desire for something as near as possible to a solitude adieu with melanie they could not have had a better companion mr chamberlain was nothing less than perfect in his position as companion and guest he enjoyed madame reynier's grand duchess manners and spared himself no trouble to entertain both madame reynier and melanie he was a hearty admirer if not a suitor of the younger woman but certain it was that if he ever had entertained personal hopes in regard to her he buried them in the depths of his heart by the end of their first day on the sea-bell he understood aleck's position with regard to melanie without being told and instantly brought all his loyalty and courtesy into his friend's service madame Renier, had an interest in seeing the smaller towns and cities of america something besides the show places she said so they made visits ashore here and there though not many as they grew to feel more at home on the yacht the more reluctant they were to spend their time on land why have dust and noise in elbowing people when they might be cutting through the blue waters with the wind fresh in their faces the weather was perfect the thrall of the sea was upon them the roses came into melanie's cheeks and she forgot all about the professional advice which she had been at such pains to procure in new york there was happiness in her eyes when she looked on her lover even though she had repulsed him as for mr chamberlain he breathed the very air of content madame reynier with her inscrutable grand manner confessed that she had never before been able precisely to locate boston and now that she had seen it she felt much better even aleck's lean bulk seemed to expand and flourish in the atmosphere of happiness about him his sudden venture was a success beyond a doubt the party had many merry hours many others full of a quiet pleasure none that were heavy or uneasy if aleck's outer man prospered in this unexpected excursion it can only be said that his spiritual self flowered with a new and hitherto unknown beauty it was a late flowering possibly though what are thirty-four years to infinity but there was in it a richness and delicacy which was its own distinction and won its own reward melanie's words spoken in their long interview in the new york home had contained an element of truth there was a poignant sincerity in her saying you do not love me enough which touched aleck to the centre of his being he was not niggardly by nature and had he given stintingly of his affection to this woman who was to him the best his whole nature shrank from such a role even while he dimly perceived that he had been guilty of acting it if he had been small in his gift of love it was because he had been the dupe of his theories he had forsworn gallantry toward women and had unwittingly cast aside warmth of affection also but such a condition was after all more apparent than real in his heart aleck knew that he did love melanie enough however much that might be 
he loved her enough to want not only and not mainly what she could give to him but he wanted the happiness of caring for her cherishing her rewarding her faith with his own she had not seen that and it was his problem to make her see it there was only one way and so in forgetting himself forgetting his wants his comforts his studies and his masculine will herein was the blossoming of aleck's soul melanie instinctively felt the subtle change and knew in her heart that aleck had won the day though she still treated their engagement as an open question aleck would read to her in his simple unaffected manner sometimes with madame reynier and mr chamberlain also for audience sometimes to her alone and since they lived keenly and loved all books spoke to them of their life or their love a line a phrase a thought would ring out of the record and each would be glad that the other had heard that thought some time they would talk it all over they learned to laugh at their own whimsical prejudices and then insisted on them all the harder they learned each from the other some bit of robust optimism some happiness of vision some further reach of thought after they had read they would play at quoits struggling sternly against each other or chamberlain would examine melanie in nautical lore or together in the evening they would trace the constellations in the heavens during their first week they were in the edge of a storm for a night and a day but they put into harbour where they were comfortable and safe and merry as larks through it all so day by day aleck hedged melanie about with his love was she thoughtful he let her take as she would his thoughts the best he could give from his mature experience was she gay he liked that even better and delighted to cap her gaiety with his own queer whimsical drolleries whatever her mood he would not let her get far from him in spirit it was not in her heart to keep him from her but aleck achieved the supermundane feat of making his influence felt most keenly when she was alone she dwelt upon him and her thoughts more intensely than she herself knew and that intenseness was only the reflection of his own thought for her they had been sailing a little more than a week changing the low placid connecticut fields for the rougher northern shores going sometimes farther out to sea but delighting most in the sweet pine-fringed coast of maine there were no more large cities to visit only small villages where fishermen gathered after their week's haul or where slow primitive boat-building was still carried on most of the inhabitants of the coast country appeared to be farmers as well as fishermen even where the soil was least promising the aspect of the shores was that of a limited but fairly prosperous agricultural community under the shadow of the hills were staid little homes or fresh painted smart cottages sometimes a bold rock bank formed the shore for miles and miles and the hills would vanish for a space here and there were headlands formed by mighty boulders against which the waves endlessly dashed and as endlessly foamed back into the sea such a headland loomed up on their starboard one evening when the sun was low and as the plumes of spray from the incoming waves rose high in the air a rainbow formed itself in the fleeting mist it was a fairy picture repeating itself two or three times no more that's my symbol of hope said aleck quite impersonally to anybody who chose to hear mr chamberlain turned to aleck with his ready courtesy not the only one you have received i hope on this charming voyage madame reynier was ready with her pleasant word aren't we all symbols for you if not of hope then of your success as a host we've lost our aches and our pains our nerves and our troubles all gone overboard from the seagull you're all tremendously good to me i know that said aleck his slow words coming with great sincerity melanie kept silence but she remembered the rainbow 
the headland was the landward end of a small island one part of which was thickly wooded a large unused house stood in the clearing evidently once a rather pretentious summer residence though now there were many signs of dilapidation the pier on the beach had been almost entirely beaten down by storms and a small flimsy slip had taken its place running far down into the water a thin line of smoke rose from the chimney of one of the outbuildings and while they looked and listened the raucous cry of a peacock came to them over the still water presently chamberlain suggested i feel it in my bones that there'll be lobsters over there to be had for the asking i heard your man say he wanted lobsters van and i believe i'll row over there and see i'm feeling uncommonly fit and need some exercise all right i'll go too said aleck i'll bet a bouquet that i beat you rowing over miss Rainier to furnish the bouquet was chamberlain's next proposition do you agree to that my lady and pray where should i get a bouquet oh the next time we we'll get on land and we won't put up with any old bouquet of juniper bushes and rocks either we want a good old-fashioned round bouquet of garden posies with mignonette round the edge and a rose in the middle a sure enough token of esteem that kind of thing you know is it a bargain miss rainier very well it is a bargain agreed melanie but i shall choose bachelor's buttons so they took the tender and got off with a great show of exactness as to time and strictness of rules madame Rainier was to hold the watch and aleck was to wave a white handkerchief the minute they touched sand mr chamberlain was to give a like signal when they started back the yacht slowed down and held her place as nearly as possible chamberlain pulled a great oar and was in fact far superior to aleck in point of skill but his stroke was not well adapted to the choppy waves inshore he had learned it on the sleepy cam where the long gliding blade counts best the men stayed ashore a long time disappearing entirely beyond the clump of trees that screened the outbuildings when they reappeared an old man was with them following them down to the boat then the white handkerchief appeared and the boat started on its return aleck profited by chamberlain's work and made the boat leap forward by a shorter almost jerky stroke he came back easily with five minutes to spare good work said mr chamberlain you have me beaten and you'll get the bachelor's buttons but you had the tide with you nonsense i had the lobsters extra asserted aleck well if you had been born an englishman we'd make an oarsman out of you yet huh said aleck but they had news to tell the ladies and while they were having their dinner their thoughts were turned to another matter the island it appeared had for some years been abandoned by its owner and its only inhabitant was a grey and grisly old man known to the region as the hermit his fancy was to keep a light burning always by night in the landward window of his cabin so as to warn sailors off the dangerous headland there was no lighthouse in the vicinity and by a kindly consent the people on the neighbouring islands and on the mainland opposite encouraged his benevolent delusion if delusion it might be called they contrived to send him provisions at least once a week and they had supplied him with a flag which it was understood he would fly in case he was in actual need so alone with his cow and his fowls the old hermit spent his days winter and summer tending his lamp when the dark came on aleck and mr chamberlain had picked up some of this information at the last port which the seagull made but what was of new and real interest to them now was the story which the old man told them of a castaway on the island a few days before all hands had abandoned the yacht just before she went down it appears the owner was robbed by his own men and marooned on the hermit's island that's the gist of it said aleck the hermit said the man wouldn't eat off his table went on mr chamberlain but asked him for raw eggs and ate them outdoors 
said that except when he asked for eggs he never spoke without cursing at least the hermit couldn't understand what he said so he thought it was cursing and while the old man was talking added chamberlain resentfully that blooming peacock squawked like a demon the yacht that went down according to the man was the jeanne d'arc said aleck who had been grave enough between all their light-hearted talk i didn't tell you chamberlain that my cousin my old chum went off quite unexpectedly on a boat called the jeanne d'arc where he went or what for i don't know of course it may have been another jeanne d'arc it probably was but it troubles me melanie was instantly aroused oh i had an uncanny feeling when you first mentioned the jeanne d'arc she cried but could you not find out more what became of the man that was marooned he got off the island a day or two ago said aleck the people that brought provisions to the old man took him to the mainland to charlesport the beggar left without so much as thanking the old man for his eggs added chamberlain we'll put into charlesport to-night if you don't mind said aleck if i can find the man that was marooned i may be able to learn something about jim if he really was on the yacht you can all go ashore if you like there's a big summer hotel near by and it's a lovely country we'll stay wherever it's most convenient for you to have us said melanie looking at aleck for once with more than a friendly interest in her eyes but perhaps i can help you van two heads you know said chamberlain aleck troubled as he was could not help being grateful to his friends so the seagull turned suddenly from her holiday mood headed into the harbour of charlesport the village still rang if so staid a community could be said to ring with reports of the event of the week before dr thayer had been sphinx-like and little simon had been imaginative and voluble and it would have been difficult to say which had teased the popular curiosity the more aleck found a tale ready for his ears about the launch and its three passengers with many conflicting details some said that a great singer had been wrecked off ram's head others that it was the captain and mate of the jeanne d'arc others that it was a daughter of old parson thayer's sweetheart and two sailors that came ashore little or nothing was known about the island castaway aleck followed the only clue he could find thinking to get at least some inkling of the truth End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrari. Chapter Thirteen. Alec sees a ghost. Little Simon drove leisurely up the long, rugged hill over which Agatha and James had so recently travelled, and drew rein in the shade at a distance of a long city block from his destination. He pointed with his whip while he addressed Alec, his sole passenger. Yonder's the old red house, mister. The parson he hated to have his trees nod, and Major hears a great horse for gnawing the bark off her trees, so I'd never go to no nearer the house than this. All right, Simon, you wait for me here. Alec walked slowly along the country road, enjoying the fragrant fields, the quiet beauty of the place. It was still early in the day, for he had lost no time in following the clues gathered from the village as to the survivors of the Jeanne d'Arc. The air was fresh and clean, with a tang of the distant salt marshes. A long row of hemlocks and Norway spruce bordered the road, and, with the aid of a stone wall, shut off from the highway a prosperous-looking vegetable garden. Further along, a flower garden glowed in the fantastic coloring which gardens acquire when planted for the love of flowers rather than for definite artistic effects farther still two lilac bushes stood sentinel on either side of a gateway and behind a deep green lawn lay under the light dappled shade of tall trees it was a lawn that spoke of many years of care and in the middle of its velvet green under the branches of two sheltering elms stood the old red house 
it looked comfortable and secure in its homely simplicity something to depend on in the otherwise mutable scenes of life aleck felt an instantaneous liking for it and was glad that his errand sad as it might possibly be had yet led him thither long french windows in the lower part of the house opened upon the piazza and from the second story ruffled white curtains fluttered to the breeze as the shield-shaped knocker clanged dully to aleck's stroke a large melancholy hound came slowly round the corner of the house approached the visitor with tentative wags of the tail and after sniffing mildly lay down on the cool grass it wasn't a house to be hurried that was plain after a wait of five or ten minutes aleck was about to knock again when a face appeared at one of the side lights of the door presently the door itself opened a few inches and an elderly spinsterhood wrapped in severe inquiry looked out at him can i see the lady or either of the gentlemen who recently arrived here from the yacht the jean d'arc aleck's voice and manner were friendly enough to disarm suspicion itself sally kingsbury looked at him for a full second come in aleck followed her into the wide dim hall and waited while she pulled down the shade of the side light which she had lifted for observation then she opened a door on the right and said sit down in the parlor while i go and take my salt risings away from the stove i ain't had time to call my soul my own since the folks came what with callers at all times of the day sally's voice was not as inhospitable as her words she was mildly hurt and grieved rather than offended she disappeared and presently came back with a white apron on in place of the colored gingham she had worn before but it is doubtful if aleck noticed this tribute to his sex sally looked withered and pinched but more by nature and disposition than by age she stood with arms akimbo near the centre table regarding aleck with inquisitiveness not unmixed with liking you can sit down sir she said politely but i don't know as you can see any of the folks the man he's upstairs sick clean out of his head and the young man he's nursing him can't leave him alone a minute or he'd be up and getting out the window for all i know aleck listened sympathetically a sad case and what is the name if i may ask of the young man who is so ill lord i don't know said sally the new mistress her name's redmond some kin of parson thayer's and she's got this house and a lot of money the lawyer was here yesterday and got the will all fixed up she's a singer too one of those opry singers down below she is sally made this announcement as if she was relating a bewildering blow of providence for which she herself was not responsible aleck who began to fear that he might be the recipient of more confidences than decorum dictated hastily proffered his next question can i see the lady miss redmond or is it mrs redmond sally gave a scornful injured sniff miss redmond sir though she's old enough to be a missus i wouldn't so much mind her coming in here and using the parson's china that i always washed with my own hands if she was a missus but what can she an unmarried woman and an opry singer know about parson thayer's ways and keeping this house in order when i've been with him going on seventeen years and he took me out of the home when i was no more than a child aleck's heart would have been stone had he resisted this all but passionate plea you have been faithfulness itself i am sure but do you think miss redmond would see me at least for a few minutes sally recovered her dignity which had been near a collapse in tears and assumed her official tone i don't know as you can and i don't know as you can she's sick too fell overboard somehow or other off for one of those pesky boats and got neurology and i don't know what all but i'll go and see how she's feeling stay wait a minute said aleck seized with a new thought i'll write a message to miss redmond and then she'll know just what i want if you'll be so good as to take it to her 
why certainly of course i will said sally kingsbury only you needn't take all that trouble i can tell her what you want myself sally was one of those persons who regard the pen as the weapon of last resort not to be used until necessity compels but aleck continued on writing on a blank leaf of his notebook the message was this can you give me any information concerning my cousin james hamilton who was thought to be aboard the jean d'arc he tore the leaf out extracted a card from his pocket-book and handed leaf and card to sally will you please give those to miss redmond sally wiped her hands which were perfectly clean on her white apron took the card and bit of paper and departed sniffing audibly when she returned it was to say with a slightly more interested air that miss redmond wished to see him upstairs she stood at the bottom of the wide stairway and pointed to a corner of the upper floor she's in there room on the right and so she stalked off to the kitchen aleck van camp sought the region indicated by sally's gaunt finger with some misgivings but he was presently guided further by a clear voice come in this way mr van camp if you please the voice led him to an open door before which he stood looking into a large old-fashioned bedroom from whose windows the white curtains fluttered in the breeze miss redmond was propped up with pillows on a horsehair covered lounge which stood along the foot of a monstrous bed she was clothed in some sort of wool wrapper and over her feet was thrown a faded travelling rug by her side stood a chair on which were writing materials aleck's note and card and a half-written letter agatha sat up as she greeted aleck i am glad to see you mr van camp will you come in i ask your pardon for not coming downstairs to see you but i have been ill and am not strong yet she was about to motion aleck to a chair but stopped in the midst of her speech arrested by his expression aleck stood rooted to the door sill with a look of surprise on his face which amounted to actual amazement thus apparently startled out of himself he regarded agatha earnestly will you come in agatha repeated at last pardon me he said finally in his precise drawl but i confess to being startled you you bear such an extraordinary resemblance to someone i know that i thought it must really be she for a moment agatha smiled faintly he looked as if you had seen a ghost aleck gazed at her again a long scrutinizing look it does make one feel queer you know but now that you are assured that i am not a ghost will you sit down that chair by the window please and i can't tell you how glad i am to see you for james hambleton your cousin if he is your cousin is here in this house and he is ill very ill indeed aleck's nonchalance had already disappeared in the series of surprises but at agatha's words a flush of pleasure and relief overspread his face he strode quickly over toward agatha's couch oh i say old jim i thought i was afraid agatha was touched by the evidences of his emotion and her voice became very gentle i fancy it is the same james hambleton of lynn aleck nodded and she went on that's what he told me the night we were wrecked agatha looked at aleck as if she would discover whether he were trustworthy or not before giving him more of her story presently she continued he's a very brave a very wonderful man he jumped overboard to save me after i fell from the ladder and then they left us and we swam ashore but long before we got there i fainted and he brought me in all the way though he was nearly dead of exhaustion himself he had hemorrhage from overexertion and afterward a chill and now there is fever agatha's voice was trembling aleck watched her as she told her tale the flush of happiness and joy still lighting up his face as she finished relating the meagre facts which to her denoted so many heart-throbs a sob drowned her voice as aleck followed the story his own eyes wavered that's jim down to the ground good old boy he said there was silence for a minute then he heard agatha's voice grown little and faint if he should die aleck still standing by agatha's couch suddenly shook himself 
where is he can i see him now agatha got up slowly and led the way down the hall pointing to a door that stood ajar it was evident that she was weak i can't go in i can't bear to see him so ill she whispered and as aleck looked at her before entering the sick-room he saw that her eyes were filled with tears agatha went back to her couch feeling that the heavens had opened here was a friend come to her from she knew not where whose right it was to assume responsibility for the sick man he was kind and good and he loved her rescuer with the boyish devotion of their school days he would surely help he would work with her to keep death away whatever love and professional skill could do should be done there had been no question as to that of course from the beginning but here was some one who would double yes more than double her own efforts some one who was strong and well and capable her heart was thankful before aleck returned from the sick-room dr thayer's step sounded on the stairs followed by the mildly complaining voice of sally kingsbury presently the two men were in a low voice conference in the hall agatha waited while they talked feeling grateful afresh that dr thayer's grim professional wisdom was to be reinforced by mr van camp's resources when the doctor entered agatha's room her face had almost the natural flush of health ah miss agatha redmond the doctor continued frequently to address her by her full name half in affectionate deference and half with some dry sense of humor peculiar to himself miss agatha redmond so you're beginning to pick up a good thing too for i don't want two patients in one house like the one out yonder he's a very sick man miss agatha i know doctor i have seen him grow worse hour by hour ever since we came what can be done he needs special nursing now and your man in there will be worn out presently oh that can be managed send to portland to boston or somewhere we can get a nurse here soon do not spare any trouble doctor i can arrange dr thayer squared himself and paced slowly up and down agatha's room he did not reply at once and when he did it was with one of his characteristic turns toward an apparently irrelevant topic have you seen sister susan he inquired stopping by the side of agatha's couch and looking down on her with his shrewd gaze it was a needless question for he knew that agatha had not seen mrs stoddard she had been too weak and ill to see anybody agatha shook her head well miss agatha redmond susan's the nurse we need for that young gentleman over there it's constant care he must have now day and night and if he gets well it will be good nursing that does it there isn't a nurse in this country like susan when she once takes hold of a case that mr hand in there is all right but he can't sit up much longer night and day as he has been doing and he isn't a woman don't know why it is but the lord seems bent on throwing sick men into women's hands as if they weren't more than a match for us when we're well agatha's humorous smile rewarded the doctor's grim comments if that was what he wanted no doctor she said with a fleeting touch of her old lightness we're never a match for you we may entertain you or nurse you or feed you or possibly once in a century or two inspire you but we're never a match for you for which heaven be praised ejaculated the doctor fervently agatha watched him as he fumbled nervously about the room or clasped his hands behind him under his long coat-tails the greenish-black frock-coat hung untidily upon him and his white fringe of hair was anything but smooth she perceived that something other than medical problems troubled him would your sister would mrs stoddard be willing to come here to take care of mr hambleton she ventured ask me that snapped the doctor when no man on earth could tell whether she'll come or not she says she won't she's hurt and she's outraged or at least she thinks she is but if you could get her to think that it was her duty to take care of that poor boy in there she'd come fast enough agatha was puzzled she felt as if there were a dozen ways to turn and only one way that would 
lead her aright and she could not find the clue to that one right away at last she attacked the doctor boldly tell me dr thayer she said earnestly just what is it that causes mrs stoddard to feel hurt and outraged is it simply because i have inherited the money and the house she cannot possibly know anything about me personally the old doctor thrust his underjaw out more belligerently than ever while turning his answer over in his mind he took two lengths of the room before stopping again by agatha's side and looking down on her she says it isn't the money but that it's the slight hercules put upon her for leaving the place our old home out of the family that's one thing but that isn't the worst susan's orthodox you know very orthodox and she has a prejudice against your profession serving satan she calls it she thinks that's what actresses and opera singers do though how she knows anything about it i don't see the grim smile shone in the doctor's eyes even while he looked half anxiously to see how agatha was taking his explanation of mrs stoddard's attitude agatha meditated a moment if it's merely a prejudice in the abstract against my being an opera singer i think she will overcome that besides mr hambleton is neither an actor nor an opera singer he isn't serving satan well the doctor hesitated and then went on hastily with a great show of irritation susan's a little set in her views she disapproves of the way you came here says you shouldn't have been out in a boat with two men and that it's a judgment for sin your being drowned or next door to it i'm only saying this my dear miss agatha to explain to you why susan but agatha was enlightened at last and roused sufficiently to cause two red spots brighter than they had ever been in health to burn on her cheeks she sat up very straight facing dr thayer's worried gaze and interrupted him in tones ringing with anger do you mean to tell me dr thayer that your sister the sister of my mother's lifelong friend sits in her house and imagines scandalous stories about me when she knows nothing at all about the facts or about me that she thinks i was out in a boat alone with two men that she is mean enough to condemn me without knowing the first thing about this awful accident oh i have no words and agatha covered her burning face with her hands unable by mere speech to express her outraged feelings dr thayer edged uneasily about agatha's couch with a manner resembling that of a whipped dog why my dear miss agatha susan will come round in time she's not so bad really she'll come round in time only just now we haven't any time to spare don't feel so badly susan is too set in her views set cried agatha she's a horrid unchristian woman oh no remonstrated the doctor susan's all right when you once get used to her she's a trifle old-fashioned in her views but agatha was not listening to the doctor's feeble justification of susan she was thinking hard dr thayer she urged do you want that woman to come here to take care of mr hambleton isn't there any one else in this whole countryside who can nurse a sick man why i can do it myself or mr van camp his cousin could do it why should you want her of all people when she feels so toward us the moment his professional judgment came into question dr thayer slipped out from the cloud of embarrassment which had engulfed him in his recent conversation and assumed the authoritative voice that agatha had first heard my dear miss agatha redmond that is foolish talk you are half sick even now and it requires a strong person with no nerves to do what i desire done mr van camp may be his cousin but the chances are that he wouldn't know a bromide from a blister and good nurses don't grow on bushes in ilion nor in charlesport either there isn't one to be had so far as i know and we can't wait to send to augusta or portland the next few days especially the next twenty-four hours are critical agatha listened intently and a growing resolution shone in her eyes would mrs stoddard come if it were not for what you said about me she asked 
the lord only knows but i think she would replied the poor harassed doctor she's always been a regular dorcas in this neighbourhood dorcas cried agatha her anger again flaring up i should say sapphira oh now susan isn't so bad when you once know her urged the doctor agatha got up and went to the window trailing her travelling rug after her she shall come i'll bring her and sometimes she shall mend her words about me but that can wait if she will only help to save james hamilton's life now where does she live suddenly as she stood at the window she saw her opportunity there's little simon down there now under the trees and his buggy must be somewhere near will you stay here dr thayer with mr hamilton while i go to see your sister hadn't i better drive you over to see susan myself feebly suggested the doctor no i'll go alone there was anger determination gunpowder in agatha's voice but mind you don't offer her any money the doctor warned as he watched her go down the hall and disappear for an instant in the bedroom where james hamilton lay she came out almost immediately and without a word descended the wide stairway opened the dining-room door and called softly to sally kingsbury dr thayer returned to the sick-room ten minutes later he heard the wheels of little simon's buggy rolling rapidly up the road in the direction of susan stoddard's place End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this livervox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter fourteen susan stoddard's prayer there was a wide porch spotlessly scrubbed along the front of the house and two hydrangeas blooming gorgeously in tubs one on either side of the walk the house looked new and modern shiny with paint and furnished with all the conveniences offered by the relentless progress of our day little simon had informed agatha during their short drive that deacon stoddard had achieved this residence shortly before his death and his tone implied that it was the pride of the town its real treasure even to agatha's absorbed and preoccupied mind it presented a striking contrast to the old red house which had received her so graciously into its spacious comfort she marvelled that anything so fresh and modish as the house before her could have come into being in the old town it was next to a certainty that there was a model laundry with set tubs beyond the kitchen and equally sure that no old horsehair lounge subtly invited the wearied traveller to rest a cool draught came through the screen door within it was cleaner than anything agatha had ever seen the stair rail glistened the polished floors shone a neat bouquet of sweet peas stood exactly in the centre of a snow-white doily which was exactly in the middle of a shiny round table the very doormat was brand new agatha would never have thought of wiping her shoes on it agatha's ring was answered by a half-grown girl who looked scared when she saw a stranger at the door agatha walked into the parlor in spite of the girl's hesitation in inviting her and directed her to say to mrs stoddard that miss redmond from the old red house wished particularly to see her the girl's face assumed an expression of intelligent and ecstatic curiosity oh she breathed then she's putting up plums but she can come out in a few minutes she could not go without lingering to look at agatha her wide-eyed gaze taking note of her hair her dress her hands her face as agatha became conscious of the ingenuous inspection to which she was subjected she smiled at the girl one of her old radiant friendly smiles run now and tell mrs stoddard there's a good child and some time you must come to see me at the red house will you the girl's face lighted up as if the sun had come through a cloud she smiled at agatha in return with a yes under her breath thus are slaves made left alone in the cool dim parlor so orderly and spotless agatha had a presentiment of the prejudice of class and of religion 
against which she was about to throw herself susan stoddard's fanaticism was not merely that of an individual it represented the stored-up strength of hardy conscience-driven generations the stoddards might build themselves houses with model laundries but they did not thereby transfer their real treasure from the incorruptible kingdom if they were not ruled by aesthetic ideals neither were they governed by thoughts of worldly display this fragrant clean room bespoke character and family history agatha found herself absently looking down at a white wax cross entwined with wax flowers standing under a glass on the centre table it was a strange piece of handicraft its whiteness was suggestive of death not life and the curving leaves and petals through which the vital sap once flowed were beautiful no longer now that their day of tender freshness was so inappropriately prolonged as agatha with mind aloof wondered vaguely at the laborious patience exhibited in the work her eye caught sight of an inscription moulded in the wax pedestal brother her mind was sharply brought back from the impersonal region of speculation what she saw was not merely a sentimental misguided attempt at art it was susan stoddard's memorial of her brother hercules thayer the man who had so unexpectedly influenced agatha's own life to susan stoddard this wax cross was the symbol of the companionship of childhood and of all the sweet and bitter involved in the inexplicable bond of blood relationship agatha felt more kindly toward her because of this mute fantastic memorial she looked up almost with her characteristic friendly smile as she heard slow steady steps coming down the hall the eyes that returned agatha's look were not smiling though they did not look unkind they gazed without embarrassment as without pride into agatha's face as if they would probe at once to the covered springs of action mrs stoddard was a thick-set woman rather short looking toward sixty with iron-gray hair parted in the middle and drawn back in an old-fashioned pretty way it was to the credit of mrs stoddard's breeding that she took no notice of agatha's peculiar dress unsuited as it was to any place but the bedroom even in the morning mrs stoddard herself was neat as a pin in a cotton gown made for utility not beauty she stood for an instant with her clear untroubled gaze full upon agatha then drew forward a chair from its mathematical position against the wall when she spoke her voice was a surprise it was so low and deep with a resonance like that of the cello it was not the voice of a young woman it was rather a rare gift of age telling how beautiful an old woman's speech could be moreover it carried refinement of birth and culture a beauty of phrase and enunciation which would have marked her with distinction anywhere how do you do miss redmond agatha standing by the table with the cross made no movement toward the chair she was not come face to face with mrs stoddard for the purpose of social visitation but because in the warfare of life she had been sent to the enemy with a message that at least was agatha's point of view officially she was come to plead with mrs stoddard personally she was hot and resentful at her unjust words her reply to her hostess's greeting was brief and her attitude unbending i have come to ask you mrs stoddard agatha began though to her chagrin she found her voice was unsteady i have come personally to ask you mrs stoddard if you will help us in caring for our friend who is very ill your brother dr thayer wishes it it is a case of life and death maybe and skilful nursing is difficult to find agatha's hand that rested on the table was trembling by the time she finished her speech she was vividly conscious of the panic that had come upon her nerves at a fresh realization of the wall of defence and resistance which she was attempting to assail it spoke to her from mrs stoddard's calm otherworldly eyes from her serene deep voice no miss redmond that work is not for me but please mrs stoddard will you not reconsider your decision 
it is not for myself i ask but for another one who is suffering mrs stoddard's gaze went past agatha and rested on the white cross with the inscription brother she slowly shook her head saying again no that work is not for me the lord does not call me there as the two women stood there with the funeral cross between them each with her heart's burden of griefs convictions and resentments each recoiled sensitively from the other's touch but life and the burden life imposes were too strong how can you say mrs stoddard that work is not for me when there is suffering you can relieve sickness that you can cure i am asking a hard thing i know but we will help to make it as easy as possible for you and we are in great need should the servants of the lord falter in doing his work mrs stoddard's voice intoned reverently while she looked at agatha with her sincere eyes no he gives strength to perform his commands but sickness and sorrow and death are on every hand to some it is appointed for a moment's trial to others it is the wages of sin we cannot alter the lord's decrees agatha stared at the rapt speaker with amazed eyes and presently the anger she had felt at dr thayer's words rose again within her breast doubly strong the doctor had given but a feeble version of the judgment here was the real voice hurling anathema as did the prophets of old but even as she listened she gathered all her force to combat the sword of the spirit which had so suddenly risen against her you are a hard and unjust woman to talk of the wages of sin what do you know of my life or of him who is sick over at the red house who are you to sit in judgment upon us i am the humblest of his servants replied susan stoddard and there was no shadow of hypocrisy in her tones she went on almost sorrowfully but we are sent to serve and obey keep ye separate and apart from the children of this world is his commandment and i have no choice but to obey besides and she looked up fearlessly into agatha's face we do know about you it is spoken of by all how you follow a wicked and worldly profession you can't touch pitch and not be defiled the temple must be purged and emptied of worldliness before christ can come in agatha was baffled by the very simplicity and directness of mrs stoddard's words even though she felt that her own texts might easily be turned against her but she had no heart for argument even if it would lead her to verbal triumph over her companion instinctively she felt that not thus was mrs stoddard to be won whatever you may think about me or about my profession mrs stoddard she said you must believe me when i say that mr hambleton is free from your censure and worthy of your sincerest praise he is not an opera singer of that i am convinced susan stoddard here interpolated a stern don't you know listen mrs stoddard cried agatha in desperation when the yacht the jeanne d'arc began to sink there was panic and fear everywhere while i was climbing down into one of the smaller boats the rope broke and i fell into the water i should have drowned then and there if it had not been for this man for all the rest of the ship's load jumped into the boats and rowed away to save themselves he helped me to come ashore after i had become exhausted by swimming he is ill and near to death because he risked his life to save mine is not that a heaven-inspired act mrs stoddard's eyes glistened at agatha's tale which had at last got behind the older woman's armour but her next attack took a form that agatha had not foreseen in a reverent voice so suited to exhortation she demanded and what will you do with your life now that you have been saved by the hand of god will you dedicate it to him whose child you are agatha chafing in her heart paused a moment before she answered my life has not been without its tests of faith and of conscience mrs stoddard and who of us does not wish with the deepest yearning to know the right and to do it knowledge comes from the lord 
came mrs stoddard's words like an antiphonal response in the litany my way has been different from yours and it is a way that would be difficult for you to understand possibly but you shall not condemn me without reason are you going to marry that man you have been living with these many days was the next stern inquiry a stinging blush a blush of anger and outraged pride as much as of modesty surged up over agatha's face she was silent a moment and in that moment learned what it was to control anger i have not been living with this man in any sense of the term mrs stoddard i will say this once for all to you though i never would in any other conceivable situation reply to such a question and such an implication you have no right to say or think such things wickedness must be rebuked of the lord intoned mrs stoddard are you his mouthpiece said agatha scornfully but she was rebuked for her scorn by mrs stoddard's look her eyes rested on agatha's face with pleading impatience as if she were a world mother apologizing for the salvation of her children it is his command to pluck the brand from the burning said susan stoddard ungodly example is a sin and earthly love often a snare for youthful feet as agatha listened to mrs stoddard's strange plea the instinct within her which from the first moment of the interview had recoiled from this fanatical but intensely spiritual woman found its way as it were into the light such was the power of her sincerity that in spite of the extraordinary character of the interview agatha's heart throbbed with a new comprehension which was almost love she stepped closer to susan stoddard her tall figure overtopping the other's sturdy one and took one of her strong work-hardened hands mrs stoddard this man has never spoken a word of love to me but if i ever marry it will be a man like him a plain high-hearted gentleman there you have a woman's secret and now come with me and help us to save a life you cannot you must not refuse me now the subtle changes of the mind are hard to trace and are often obscure even to the eye of science but every day those changes make or mar our joy susan stoddard looked for a long minute up into the vivid face bending over hers while her spirit even as agatha's had done pierced the hedge which separated them and comprehended something of the goodness in the other soul finally she laid her other hand over agatha's enclosing it in a strong clasp then with a certain pathetic pride in her submission she said i have been wrong agatha i will come agatha's grateful eyes dwelt on hers but the strain of the interview was beginning to count she sank down in the chair that mrs stoddard had offered at the beginning of their meeting and covered her eyes with one hand the elder woman kept the other we will not go to our task alone she said we will ask god's help the prayer of faith shall heal the sick then falling to her knees by agatha's side with rapt lifted face and closed eyes she made her confession and her petition to the lord her ringing voice intoned the phrases of the bible as if they had been music and bore the burden of her deepest soul she said she had been sinful in imputing unrighteousness to others and that she had been blinded by her own wilfulness she prayed for the stranger within her gates for the sick man over yonder and implored god's blessing on the work of her hands and praise should be to the lord amen and now angie she said practically as she rose to her feet addressing the girl who instantly appeared from around the doorway go and tell little simon to drive up to the horse block agatha you go home and rest and i'll get hitched up and be over there almost as soon as you are angie will help me get the ice bag and all the other things in case you might not have them handy come agatha but they paused yet a moment stopping as if by a common instinct to look at the white cross susan stoddard gazed down on it with a grief in her eyes 
that was the more heart-breaking because it was inarticulate agatha remembered the doctor's words and understood something of the friction that could exist between this evangelistic sister and the finer more intellectual brother i've never been inside the old red house since he died said mrs stoddard i'm sorry cried agatha it is hard for you to come there i know he maketh the rough places plain chanted susan stoddard hercules was a good brother and a good man agatha laid her arm about the older woman's shoulder and thus was led out to little simon's buggy susan helped her in and agatha leaned back with closed eyes indifferent to the beauty of early afternoon on a cool summer's day little simon let her ride in quiet but landed her in the dust on the opposite side of the road from the lilac bushes those trees said dr thayer's voice as he came out to meet her how did you make out with susan she's coming said agatha is your patient any better i don't think he's any worse answered the doctor dubiously but i'm glad susan's coming i'd be glad to know how you got round her agatha paused a moment before replying i wrestled with her the doctor smiled grimly i've known the rustling to come out the other way i can believe that said agatha well it's fairly to your credit and perhaps this was as near praise as his new england speech ever came End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter fifteen echoes from the city sally kingsbury unused to psychological analysis could not have explained why mr hunt was so objectionable to her he was no relative of the family she had discovered that and accustomed as she was to the old-fashioned gentility of a thrifty new england town instinct told her that he could not possibly be one of its varied products he might have come from anywhere he talked so little that he was suspicious on that ground alone and when he did speak there was no accent at all that sally could lay hold of useful as he was just now in taking care of that poor young man upstairs he nevertheless inspired in her breast a most unholy irritation her attitude was that of a housemaid pursuing the cat with the broom mr hand was not greatly troubled by sally's tendency to sweep him out of the way but whenever he took any notice of her he was more than a match for her on the afternoon following agatha's visit to mrs stoddard he appeared to show some slight objection to being treated like the cat he ate his luncheon in the kitchen a large delightful room while alec van camp stayed with james hand was stirring broth over the stove now and then giving a sharp eye to sally's preparation of her new mistress's luncheon you haven't put any salt or pepper on mademoiselle's tray sally said he as the maid was about to start upstairs miss sally i should prefer mr hand she requested in a mournful tone of resignation and miss redmond don't take any pepper on her eggs i watched her yesterday well she may want some to-day just the same insisted mr hand in a lordly manner putting a thin silver boat filled with salt and a cheap pink glass pepper shaker side by side on the tray sally brushed hand away in disgust that doesn't go with the best silver salt cellar that's the kitchen pepper and you can say miss sally if you please no just sally if you please i've taken a great fancy to you sally and i don't like to be so formal argued hand besides i like your name and i'll carry the tray to the top of the stairs for you if you'll be good i wouldn't trouble you for the world mr hand she tossed back you'd stumble and break parson thayer's best china that i've washed for seventeen years and only broke the handle of one cup she wouldn't drink her coffee this morning out of the second-best cups went to the buttery before breakfast and picked out 
one of the best set and poured herself a cup she said it was inspiring but i call it wasteful and me with extra work all day sally disappeared leaving a dribbling trail of good-natured complaint behind her mr hand continued making broth at which he was as expert as he was at the lever of or the launch engine he strained and seasoned and regarded two floating islands of oily substance with disapproval while he was working sally joined him again at the stove her important and injured manner all to the front says she'll take another egg she explained only took one yesterday and then i had two all cooked what did i tell you jeered hand you didn't tell me anything about eggs not that i recollect sally replied tartly well the principle's the same asserted hand after a moment his countenance assumed a crafty and jocose expression which would have put even sally on her guard if she had looked up in time to see it you won't have so much extra work when mademoiselle's maid arrives he said slyly she'll wait on mademoiselle and attend to her tray when she wants one and you won't have to do anything for mademoiselle at all sally became slowly transfixed in a spread-eagle attitude with the half of a thin white eggshell held up in each hand a maid when's she coming ought to be here now she's had time enough but women never can get round without wasting a lot of time sally's glance must have brought him to his senses for he added hastily city women i mean hm. she won't touch parson thayer's china not if i know myself sally disappeared with miss redmond's second egg when she returned she delivered a message to the effect that miss redmond wished to see mr hand when he had finished his luncheon he was off instantly calling watch that broth sally it was a different hand however who entered miss redmond's room a moment later his half impudent manner changed to distant respect tinged with a sort of personal adoration agatha felt it though it was too tangible to be taken notice of either for rebuke or reward agatha was sitting in a rocking-chair by the window sipping her tea out of the best teacup her tray on a stand in front of her she looked excited and flushed but her eyes were tired can i do anything for you mademoiselle hand inquired courteously yes please answered agatha and paused a moment as if to recall her thoughts in order hand was very presentable in negligee shirt which sally must have washed while he was asleep he was one of those people who look best in their working or sporting clothes ruddy clean and strong he would have dwindled absolutely into the commonplace in sunday clothes if he was ever so rash as to have any i wish to talk with you a little said agatha we haven't had much opportunity of talking so far and perhaps it is time that we understand each other a little better as mademoiselle wishes conceded hand in the first place agatha went on i must tell you that mrs stoddard is coming to help nurse mr hambleton you have been very good to stay with us so long and if you will stay on i shall be glad but dr thayer thinks you should have help and so do i especially for the next few days that is entirely agreeable to me mademoiselle will you tell me what remuneration you were receiving as chauffeur pardon me but that is unnecessary mademoiselle if you will allow me to stay here either taking care of mr hambleton or in any outdoor work for a week or as long as you may need me i shall consider myself repaid i was wondering agatha was silent while she buttered a last bit of toast hans reticence and evident secretiveness were baffling she had no intention of letting the point of wages go by in the way haunt indicated but after deliberation she dropped it for the moment in order to take up another matter i was wondering she began again how you happened to escape from the jean d'arc alone in a rowboat and what your connection with monsieur chatelard was will you tell me a perfectly vacant look came into hunt's face he might have been deaf and dumb at last agatha began again 
i am grateful exceedingly grateful mr hand for all that you have done for us since this catastrophe but i can't have any mystery about people that is absurd did you leave the jean d'arc when the others did when i fell into the water this time hand consented to answer no mademoiselle i did not know you had fallen into the water until i brought you ashore in the morning then how did you get off well it was rather queer the men were all tired out working at the pumps and monsieur chatelard ordered a seaman named bazinet and me to relieve two of them he said he would call us when the boats were lowered as the yacht was then getting pretty shaky bazinet and i worked a long time and when finally we got on deck thinking the jeanne d'arc was nearly done for the boats had put off we heard someone shouting and bazinet got frightened and jumped for the boat he thought they'd wait for him it was too dark for me to see whether he made it or not i stayed on the yacht for some time not knowing anything better to do hand allowed himself a faint smile and at last after a hunt i found that extra boat stowed away aft it was very small and it leaked probably that was why they did not think of using it but it was better than nothing i found some putty and a tin bucket and got food and a lot of other things though the boat filled so fast that i had to throw most everything out but i got ashore as you know i didn't even wait to see the last of the jeanne d'arc agatha's eyes shone hans story was perfectly simple and plausible but the other question was even more important she hesitated before repeating it however and rewarded hans unusual frankness with a grateful look that was a night of experience for us all she said with a little sigh at the memory of it but tell me agatha looked up squarely at hunt only to encounter his deaf and dumb expression if you will excuse me mademoiselle said hunt deferentially i think mr hambleton's broth is burning ah well very well said agatha and in spite of herself she smiled hunt found mrs stoddard installed in james hambleton's room dr thayer and alec had gone both leaving word that they would return before night mrs stoddard had smoothed james bed folded down the sheet with exactness noted her brother's directions for treatment and sat reading her bible by the window mr hand stood for a moment silently regarding first the patient then his nurse by the grace of god he will pull through i firmly believe ejaculated mrs stoddard as the first words came in that resonant deep voice hand thought that the new nurse was swearing though presently he changed his mind yes ma'am he replied with unwonted meekness then i'll sleep an hour or two if that is agreeable to you ma'am perfectly heartily responded mrs stoddard and mr hand disappeared like the mist before the sun it was to be an afternoon of excitement after all though agatha thought that she would apply herself to the straightening out of much necessary business but after an hour's work over letters at parson thayer's desk there occurred an ebullition below which could be nothing less than the arrival of lizzie agatha's maid with sundry articles of luggage she was a small-minded but efficient city girl clever enough to keep her job by making herself useful and sophisticated to the point of indecency no woman ought ever to have known so much as lizzie knew agatha was to hear how she had been relieved by the telegram several days before how she had nearly killed herself packing in such haste how she thought she was travelling to the ends of the earth coming thus to a region she had never heard of before big simon who had been instructed to watch for lizzie and bring her and her baggage out presently arrived with the trunks having sent the maid on ahead in the buggy with his son big simon positively declined to carry the two trunks to the second floor saying he thought they'd like it just as well or better if he left them in the hall downstairs lizzie was angrily hesitating whether to argue with him or use the persuasion of one of her mistress's silver coins when agatha interfered and saved her from making the mistake of her life 
it is doubtful if she could have lived in ilium after having been guilty of tipping one of its foremost citizens and even if she had she would not have got the trunks taken upstairs the prospect of discarding sally kingsbury's makeshifts and wearing a dress which belonged to her had more comfort in it than agatha had ever believed possible and the reality was even better she made a toilet for the first time in many days with her accustomed accessories dressed herself in a white wool gown and felt better are these the relatives you were visiting miss redmond inquired lizzie eaten up with curiosity which was her mortal weakness agatha paused struck with the form of the maid's question but knowing her liking for items of news she answered cautiously not relatives exactly the thayers were old friends of my mother lizzie shook out a skirt and hung it in a wardrobe in the far corner of the room she was bursting to know everything about miss redmond's sudden journey but knew better than to appear anxious the message at the hotel was so indefinite that i didn't know at all what i should do after the excitement quieted down a little i went out to visit my cousin hattie in the bronx what sort of excitement oh newspaper men and the manager and herr weimar of the orchestra and a lot of other people who came wanting to see you immediately they seemed to think i was hiding you somewhere agatha smiled she could imagine lizzie in her new-fledged importance talking to all those people you spoke of a message ventured agatha yes the one you sent the day you left miss redmond the hotel clerk said you had suddenly left town on a visit to a sick relative oh yes lizzie's quick scent was already on the trail of a mystery but agatha was in no mood just then to give her any version of the events of that monday afternoon was there any other message miss redmond some word for me which the clerk forgot to deliver no nothing else mr straker came tuesday morning with some contracts for you to sign he said that you had an appointment with him and he was nearly crazy when he found you had gone away without leaving your address agatha smiled more and more broadly to lizzie's disgust but she could not help it i don't doubt he was disturbed did he come again come again miss redmond lizzie hung a blue silk coat over its hanger held it carefully up to the light and turned toward her mistress with the mien of a person who isn't to be bamboozled he came twice every day to see if i had any word from you and when i went to cousin hattie's he called me up on the phone every morning and evening most unreasonable mr straker was he said there wasn't a singer in town he could get to fill your engagements and he was losing a hundred dollars a day he's very much put out miss redmond well i was too said agatha but somehow her tone failed to satisfy the maid to agatha the thought of the dictatorial manager fluttering about new york in quest of a vanished singer well the picture had its humorous side it had its serious side too for agatha of course but for the moment she put off thinking about that lizzie however had borne the brunt of mr straker's vexation and in that lumber-box she called her mind she regarded the matter solely as her personal cue to come more prominently upon the stage then your accompanist came every morning as you had directed miss redmond and madame florio sent word a dozen times about those new gowns lizzie with the memory of her sudden importance almost took up the role of baffled innocence i declare miss redmond i didn't know what to do or say to those people the whole thing seemed so irregular with you not leaving any word of explanation with me that is true lizzie it was irregular and certainly very inconvenient and it is serious enough so far as breaking my engagements is concerned but the circumstances were very unusual and pressing some one else gave the message at the hotel and as you know i had no time even to get a satchel that's what i said when the reporters came that you were so worried about your sick relative that you did not wait for anything agatha groaned did did the papers have much to say about my leaving town 
they had columns miss redmond and some of them had your picture on the front page with an announcement of your elopement but mr straker contradicted that he told them he had heard from you and that you were at the bedside of a dying relative besides that miss redmond the difficulty in getting up an elopement story was the lack of a probable man your manager and your accompanist were both found and interviewed and there wasn't anybody else in new york except me who knew you your discretion miss redmond has always been remarkable agatha was suddenly tired of lizzie very well lizzie that will do you may go and get your own things unpacked we shan't return to new york for several days yet you've heard from mr straker of course miss redmond no but i have written to him explaining everything why oh nothing only when i sent him word that i had heard from you he said at first that he was coming here with me some business prevented him but he must have telegraphed maybe he has but it takes some time evidently for a hidden person to be discovered in ilion as soon as the words were off her lips agatha realized that she had made a slip one has to look sharp when talking to a sophisticated maid but were you hiding miss redmond lizzie artlessly inquired oh no lizzie don't be silly the telegram probably went wrong telegrams often do not when mr straker sends them proffered lizzie but if his telegrams have gone wrong you may count on his coming down here himself he is much worried over the rehearsals which begin early in the month he said and he got the full directions you sent me for coming here he would have them agatha knew her manager's pertinacity when once on the track of an object moreover the humor of the situation passed from her mind leaving only a vivid impression of the trouble and worry which were sure to follow such a serious breaking up of well-established plans she was rarely capricious even under vexation but she yielded to a caprice at this moment and one moreover that was very unjust toward her much tried manager the thought of that man bursting in upon her in the home that had been the fastidious hercules theirs in the midst of her anxiety and sorrow over james hambleton was intolerable if mr straker should by any chance follow me here you must tell him that i cannot see him she said and departed leaving lizzie wrapped in righteous indignation well i never she exclaimed after her mistress had disappeared can't see him after coming all this way and into a country like this too where there's only one bathtub and you fill that from a pump in the yard End of chapter fifteen